little bit about the changes in the Middle East over the last few years, particularly this last year. And let me preface that by saying that the region is going through a period of fluidity and uncertainty that a lot of the actors and a lot of the processes are still underway. So we're seeing a continuously changing picture. But already we can identify some features and bring back a debate, perhaps, of understanding, analyzing, and perhaps even predicting the, the course of the region. And I will be expressing some of the views that are being exchanged inside the region about the way the region is interacting with the external world, with the outside, with the global system, but also the way the region is understanding itself. And I think that perhaps might be useful in terms of the range of views that we are seeing in this meeting. Let me start with talking a little bit about the way the region sees the international system and the way the international system is impacting it. One of the issues there is to look at the U.S.-Russia relationship and to analyze it and to understand it as either an effort to co-manage the region or a continuation of, of conflict between and competition between these two powers. And people inside the region who have been writing on this have been looking at issues like the way the Iran 5 plus 1 uh, issue was dealt with, uh, negotiation was dealt with, uh, the way the Syria chemical weapons and Geneva 2 conference were organized as a result of a collaborative effort between Washington and Moscow. Now that's one model, but you can also see areas of continuing conflict and competition between those two powers, and that continues in practical policies in Syria, for example, but in other areas. And I would submit that the recent strengthening of relationship, the opening of relations, uh, and the enthusiasm shown by the Russians and the Egyptians is understood in that, in that uh, context. And I think it is a bigger strategic move than many analysts have explained it. Uh, and I see it as also a shift in Egyptian policy back to the area of neutralism that Egyptian policy has been more comfortable with traditionally. And that means that the last 40 years of U.S.-Egyptian relations, which was a quasi-alliance, need to be put between brackets as an exceptional period in Egyptian foreign policy, looking over policy from the time of the Second World War, actually, where these neutralist trends were founded and born. The other, the other issue that people inside the region have been looking at is the whole U.S. pivot to Asia and analyzing it as a reflection of either confused policy because some of the part of the administration has been very enthusiastic about this, while other parts have been issuing statements that the US, this is not a shift out of the Middle East, that the U.S. will continue to be engaged. So there is a, a feeling that these confused images on this, amongst other issues, are still coming out of Washington. But also it's being seen as a reflection of disinterest and disengagement, and thus raising doubts about the reliability of partnership with the United States. The, the third trend or phenomenon that's being focused on by people inside the region is the issue of what direct Western intervention in the region. There, there, there is a feeling that there is a an increase in the level of external intervention in the region. Now, more recently people are saying 
it seems that the level of direct intervention has actually peaked. And because of a number of, of, of things that, that have happened, one of them is the experience, uh, experiences ranging from Afghanistan to Iraq to Libya, where direct intervention has not produced the kind of results that were expected. And that the investment seems to be very, very big. And the, the cost in terms of even the political careers and the legacy left by leaders is too high. Now, one, one a dramatic example of this was, and I think one of the critical turning points, was the vote in the House of Commons on the issue of participating in uh, a US-led attack on Syria in the context of the Syrian chemical weapons issue, and, I, and I, I, I think in retrospect that was a big turning point in the, reflecting the developing attitudes of Western public opinion towards direct intervention and paying the costs of that. Now within this, this picture there is a continual concern about the issue of how does the West influence events in cases of internal upheavals or changes, um, or even in terms of relationship with, with relationships with various regimes that are receiving assistance from the West. And here is another controversial issue of, of how do ideals, ideals sit with real interests of economic trade and, and dependency on, on oil or, or markets or uh, political alignments or continuing roles of traditional uh, protection roles militarily. In this also there is the continuing drift of EU policy that would like to have an influence in a zone that's very close to its security interests and where it has, tradition, has played a traditional role but then is torn between uh, the, the, the self-interest and, and, the, and the difficulty of, of controlling events and perhaps here the issue is the, the, the need to really ride the tiger of change uh, and, and, and try to go with the flow of change but to identify areas where cooperation can continue. Now moving again to the second part where I want to talk a little bit more about the way the region sees itself and just to bring a voice from inside the region, in contrast to many of the, many of the analysis that we see in, in, in published sources. So one of, the, one of the conclusions we see in this regional debate is a feeling that the Arab Spring has in fact run its course. Uh, definitely its, its horizontal expansion into other countries has been arrested. And its development in, in terms of internal ferment and change while continuing seems to have created a lot of uh, disillusionments and uh, another set of problems. In parallel with this, there is the whole process of disintegrating states. Now I'd like to move to the regional level of analysis and just try to capture some of the views expressed from inside the region about itself, about developments in the region. And, and the, f the first observation is the feeling that the Arab Spring has run its course, that at least in its horizontal expansion to other countries, this has been arrested. Now, there is an understanding of the continual ferment and processes that are still underway vertically inside different countries, but even there, there is already a sense of frustration because of a number of factors. One of these factors is the deteriorating quality of life economically and socially for many people in these countries. Another factor that plays a role is the factor of the youth factor in a region that is very young, where the 50% of the population is under 25 and will continue to be so into the middle of the century. So the issue of high youth unemployment, the, the, the region has the highest level of youth unemployment in the world. 
creating a lot of frustrations, but also linked to this, it's not only about economics, it's also because of the impact of media and rising expectations, patterns of consumerism coming to the country. In parallel with this level of change and, and, and in, in the understanding of the limits of the democratization process comes also the weakening of the state structures, their inability to deliver collapse in some cases uh, of services, even institutions that have particularly been at the backbone of these states, when you talk about the military, for example, or the police. And together with this, a, a concern that the order of states, the definition of states with their borders, with their regimes, with their governments, the Sykes-Picot kind of structure of states in the region has actually or is being threatened and is possibly going to undergo fundamental changes. The second observation is that the Islamic wave that took over the region after the series of Arab uprisings in 2011 has also come to an impasse. That they, it has not produced the model, the attractive model, or delivered on the goods that were promised. And that the lack of ideas and the lack of experience and the affront that this wave brought to many of the progressive liberal groups in society has caused this wave to be at least arrested, if not reversed. The third observation relates to the relationship between the Arab system of states and the Middle East systems of, system of states. And if we look at the Arab system of states and we look at the formal expression of this system in the Arab League, we'll see a continual failure in conflict resolution and prevention. Now we're going to see also a very, very varying uh, 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 fates or uh, uh, progressions by the Middle East countries, talking about Turkey, Israel, and Iran. And if you start with Iran, we see a process of re-emergence and reintegration and re-engagement with other countries in the region. If we see, look at Turkey, we see the opposite. We see a regressive process to where Turkey, after an ambitious period of getting involved in a lot of the conflict, seems to be retreating with its fingers burnt and looking internally at a lot of its own problems and wondering whether the initial enthusiasm to play a leadership, a regional leadership role was really well thought through. In the case of Israel, we see that there is more space allowed because the Palestinian issue has no longer become one that's on the front burner for many of the Arab states. But also Israel remains at a critical moment of decision in going all the way with the American Peace Initiative and finally ridding itself of the burden of the Palestinian issue or carrying on to think that the balance of power is moving uh, in its favor and waiting for another moment to resolve the conflict. A fourth phenomena that is a, is a major game changer in the region is that the Syria conflict is transforming itself into a low intensity civil war that can last for 10 or 15 years. And suddenly we're starting to talk about the Lebanese model of a lengthy uh, uh, conflict. Uh, people have talked about this, people like Nassim Talib in, in, in his book about Black Swan have talked about this, that there is a tendency often to miscalculate and to assume that a, a, a conflict would be resolved within a matter of weeks or months, but then you end up with something that is out of control with a lot of other repercussions, and this would require a change in the strategies deployed there. And amongst them, of course, is the humanitarian strategy. How does the humanitarian, how does the international community deal with the humanitarian fallout from a conflict that 
can be with us over the next 10 years. The fifth phenomena is the emerging role of the Gulf states as regional leaders at a time when the traditional leaders like Egypt are moving to a backseat position because their resource base is limited and because they're preoccupied with internal problems. And of course, you know, these countries are also challenged with the requirements of leadership, uh, being able to move quickly on decisions, maybe to formulate policy alternatives, to create coalitions, to create real solutions on the ground, to be able to deliver. Uh, so, so there is an issue on, on uh, leadership in the, in, the, in the region. Part of this problem is also the growing frustration with the mechanisms that are being applied to resolving problems in the region. For example, the, the way the 5 plus 1 agreement with Iran was negotiated, which marginalizes the Arab world, although they are the next door neighbors to Iran, and should have been the first parties to be consulted and engaged in the process. They were reduced to a role of, of observers, but also some Arab states feel that in the case of Syria, a similar pro process is of outside management. Is, is a very frustrating. There is also the issue of what are the core concerns of the region, the core concerns of regional security, of uh, uh, resolving the Palestinian issue, of, uh, of uh, uh, establishing a nuclear-free zone, of economic engagement and, and integration, and, and addressing poverty and, and disparities. A lot of these issues have been lost in the wave of Arab Spring, which brought a huge number of practical, immediate, new issues. How to support Syrian rebels, how to deal with the fallout for Jordan and Lebanon, uh, how to deal with the issue of Gulf security, how to support the economy of Egypt. So a whole new host of issues that has impacted the traditional uh, agenda, but also has overshadowed some of the critical problems and challenges in the region. And finally, looking at the Arab order as a system of states with a number of subsystems attached to it. And if we talk about countries who are members of the Arab League, like Djibouti, and, and Somalia, Sudan, you, you, you get the impression that you have a group of very fragile states that have almost fallen off the system and have sunk into uh, uh, a category of uh, ultra-poor uh, failed states uh, which, which are not receiving a lot of con you know, support or concern or follow-up from the core states in the region. So there's one, one gap in the system, huge weakness in the system. Another gap is the belt of countries across, just south of the Arab states in North Africa, where there is an emerging problem with insurgency and terrorism and, and, and uh, movements that are out of control again. Uh, creating a, a potential threat to these countries. So as the regional system get, is, is weakened and preoccupied with new issues, some of its extensions and its neighborhood is also becoming more dangerous. So overall, the region is a much more unpredictable and difficult and challenging space to deal with.